Uh, everybody, and welcome to another Cavley Conversation on Science Communication. My name is Dan Fagan. I'm a professor of science journalism here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU. I'm the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program, and also the Science Communication Workshops, which are two different programs that do two different things. One is a master's program for science journalists, uh, and uh, another is a series of workshops for scientists here at NYU to help them be better communicators. We think they're both pretty important. Uh, I will leave it to uh, Robert Lee Holtz of the Wall Street Journal to do our formal introductions, but I'll just say that we're very grateful to Lee Billings and Caleb Sharp for being here. And it's a pleasure to be uh, talking about something weird and cool uh, that has at least not that much to do with Donald <laughs> Trump. And so that's fun, uh, that's fun. Uh, and also really interesting, and it's not just about the cool science, it's also about the tricky communication issues that are involved when you're trying to write about something as potentially momentous as the discovery of uh, extraterrestrial life. Uh, so with that, I will turn things over to Lee for the formal introductions and say thank you all very much for coming and for watching us, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Dan, thank you very much. So everybody, welcome to the Arthur Carter Journalism Institute and to uh, this evening's Cavalry Conversation. Uh, we are tonight exploring the challenges of, for scientists and for science journalists of reaching for the stars in the search for exoplanets, new planets, and alien life. Now this is the third in our spring series, which are all designed to explore matters at the heart of how science journalists and scientists engage the general public. Now in a few weeks on uh, April 5th, my fellow distinguished writer in residence, Ivan Aransky, uh, will be uh, exploring uh, issues of trust and reliability in science with NPR science correspondent Richard Harris and uh, Stanford uh, health statistician uh, John Ioannidis, um, who has pioneered uh, uh, work on error in science and its importance. On April 25th, uh, Rose Eveleth uh, will explore harassment in science with BuzzFeed's uh, Azim Goryashi and uh, uh, University of Illinois anthropologist Kate Clancy, who's done some groundbreaking work in establishing uh, the pattern and pervasiveness of harassment in science. But uh, as we go forward this evening, I want to emphasize to you all that these are conversations. This is not a panel. This is not a lecture. Uh, you have a question. Uh, we want to hear it, but everyone else will want to hear it too. So as uh, Dan said, please go to the microphone uh, so we can uh, get your question on record and that the people who are uh, joining us online can also hear. And those of you online, please tweet us your questions using the hashtag Cavalry um, con, uh, Convo. And I don't know why, when I talk about people online, my eyes always go to the ceiling. But <laughs> it's kind of appropriate, I suppose, because uh, <clears throat> you know tonight we're talking about things uh, virtual and, uh, and otherworldly. We are, in fact, uh, going to discuss you know, the big question, capital B, capital Q, uh, which is, are we alone? And we have a rare pairing uh, to help us address that. Um, astrobiologist uh, Caleb Scharf, who's director of the Columbia Astrobiology Center at Columbia University uh, here in New York. Now, as a scientist, his research interests include the study of exoplanets, exomoons, and the nature of environments that might be suitable for life elsewhere. And as a uh, well-regarded popular writer, uh, he's the author of Extrasolar Planets and Astrobiology, of Gravity's Engines, uh, The Other Side of Black Holes, and most recently, of the Copernicus Complex, the co our cosmic significance in a universe of planets, uh, which explains how the future of human evolution might unfold. Um, now, I should say that he's also uh, co-founder of White House, uh, which is a nonprofit institute that has just started up here in New York, uh, which is devoted to tackling uh, what uh, we all like to think of as some of humanity's greatest questions, awareness, consciousness, and the future of intelligence. And we are also 
joined by science journalist Lee Billings, who writes about the intersection of science, technology, and culture for nature, Nautilus, new scientist, popular mechanics, scientific American, and many other publications. And his work has been included in the anthology of the best science writing online. And he is author of Five Billion Years of Solitude, uh, The Search for Life Among the Stars, which explores the history and the personalities behind the search for life uh, in the, elsewhere in the universe. And, and that uh, book, which I have to say is a quite wonderful uh, thing to read, won the 2014 Science Communication Award from the American Institute of Physics. Well, for centuries, uh, humankind has gazed at the skies and wondered what they might contain. And we are, in fact, at one of the golden moments uh, in that history. Astronomers hope they are on the verge of finding a world beyond our own solar system that might support life. I say hope. Are we alone? Now, that's the big question. But let me break that down into 3,463 smaller questions. That's about the number, as of this afternoon, of confirmed planets around other stars. I mean, really, Caleb, what do so many worlds do to the odds? Oh, what a difficult question. <laughs> I hope so. Well, Can it's I a good question. It? It's a great question. <clears throat> yeah, so um, what it definitely does is increase the odds of us finding an answer. I think. I think that we can say with some confidence because we didn't know that there were so many planets around other stars 20 years ago. And part of the, the revelation and the revolution that's going on is that actually planets are incredibly abundant and that means that potential incubators for life are everywhere in the universe. And that also means that many of them are pretty nearby to us. So what it definitely alters is the, the odds of us getting some answers. Because suppose planets were actually very rare. Suppose the solar system was sitting here and then you had to go a thousand light years to the next planetary system. That would be difficult for us if we wanted to study those planets because they're a long way away. Um, so you know, I'm, I'm doing the politician thing of kind of circling around the question here. So it definitely, the abundance of planets improves the odds of us obtaining an answer, which is huge, right? Don't, don't underestimate that. What does it mean for the actual probability of there being other life out there and how often it occurs? <clears throat> if I'm completely honest with you, we don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I think you would well, agree with that. Well, yes. yeah, so I, I have to sort of first shift you say, oh, some of these places are pretty close. I mean, as it happens, because I had a minute this afternoon, I actually worked it out how long would it take in your car to actually drive <laughs> to, Trappist, to the Trappist-1 planets, for those of you who don't know, uh, announced the discovery just last month. Seven potentially, possibly, maybe, perhaps, mm. Earth-sized yeah. planets. Um, but anyway, at the, at the speed of the average you know, family minivan, um, it would take 441 million years to get there. And then, of course, you'd have the problem of finding a parking space when you arrive. <laughs> but now, what I want to know from you, Lee, so uh, we have not uh, just started thinking about this um, uh, last month, uh, but what's driving this wave of exoplanet discoveries? Uh, well, I, I think it's a couple of different things. Uh, it's naturally the fundamental human curiosity to figure out whether or not we're alone, right? I mean, there's something existential about about dealing with these big picture questions. But more importantly, I think it, uh, people have asked them for a long time, so why now? And that's because all of a sudden, we basically have the techniques in hand, the technologies in hand, and the confidence in hand to invest in those technologies and techniques. Uh, the past 25 years or so, uh, <clears throat> which is about how long this has been going on since the first exoplanets were found, um, has seen you know, a very steady uh, progression and development of, of various uh, planet detection techniques. Um, and what's interesting, though, is that, like, really, if you look at the technology that was, that was required to develop, to find the first planets, which is um, looking at, well, the, the way they found them was essentially through looking at wobbling stars, basically, or, or the timings of, of pulsar pulses. Um, you could have done that decades ago. It's just that no one really looked in the right way uh, 
hard enough because people didn't really know planets were necessarily common and it was seen as a fringe topic. So I think it's really just the fact that, that we're all of a sudden getting a nice, um, we're, we're, you know, we, yeah, the technology's there and we can go into that in much more detail if you'd like. Let's go into that in much more detail if I like. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, it's any. It's, it's, no, as you say, it's not, okay, right. partly it's a question of inclination. Right. Um, ground based observatories are not necessarily any more right. powerful than they, well, generally speaking, um, today than they were 20 years ago. But there are some key technological things that have happened in space. Yeah, well, in space, but, and, you know, we have to be careful when we talk about um, looking for planets, and it's important to know the distinction between detecting them, which is relatively easy, and then characterizing them, finding out what they're like, which is hard, which is the new frontier, which is where we're still trying to go. And that's where we'll be going for a long time. That's, I think, the foreseeable future. So uh, if you look at the history of planet detection, uh, it goes actually back centuries. <laughs> uh, I mean, I think, well, if you're thinking about things even in the solar system where people were finding asteroids and calling new planets and so on and so forth. Uh, but for instance, uh, a guy named uh, Vanderkamp, was it, what's his first name, do you recall? Bernard? No, not Bernard. Vanderkamp, anyway. Um, Van. Yeah, we can call him Van. Um, <laughs> he had some very famous claims about planets around uh, Barnard's star, which is a nearby red dwarf. Right, yeah. And uh, it's a s star that's much smaller and cooler than the sun. And, uh, those claims ended up being refuted. He was looking at, at essentially the movement of the star in the sky and thinking he saw a wobble back and forth in the sky the, uh, and, uh, and thinking that, would, that was translating to the, the pull of an unseen planet. And uh, it turns out that that's, it doesn't look like there's a planet there, at least not like he described, but he was using you know, photographic plates. He wasn't using CCDs and, and uh, you know, digital sensors and things like that. Uh, he was using pretty old school analog technology that really was not up to the task of, of distinguishing these things. Of course, now we have, we do have uh, CCDs, the things that, that, that power the camera in your, in your iPhone. We do have hard drives. Uh, we do have uh, all that kind of stuff that essentially, again, really makes it okay, a lot Okay, but I'm not finding planets with my iPhone, at least not yet. Well, <laughs> so well. we're talking things like you just you know, the Hubble Space Telescope, the Spitzer yeah. Space Telescope, <laughs> right, the right. Kepler Space Telescope. Right, of course. Uh, so being above the Earth's atmosphere is a huge benefit. Uh, you can have a big mirror up there and there's no atmosphere to get in the way of all those delicate photons that have been traveling towards you across the emptiness of space for light years and light years. So that's, that's, that's huge, of course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so we, Caleb, we can see these things, sort of. I mean, uh, we can detect them. Let's, let's not use the C word. Um, let's use the detect word. So we can detect these things. But now from your standpoint as an astrobiologist, I mean, is this really, what can, what can you derive from what you can detect at this stage? Well, what do these thousands of data points <laughs> actually tell us? Well, to use the old English, bugger all. <laughs> Well, no, no, I mean, that's completely unfair, and I'll now have yeah. astrophysicists hounding me down the streets. Um, yeah, very we, little, very little. We have very rudimentary data. We have constraints, if we're lucky, on the mass of a planet or its, its physical size, its diameter. If we have both of those numbers, we can say something about the potential density of the planet, and that actually is quite a good discriminant for different compositions, but only in the broadest possible sense. We could say that a low density planet of this size is more likely, for example, to have a lot of water or to have a large amount of gas surrounding it. Uh, you know, we can't tell you very much, if anything, about how it's layered in the planet or how it might be distributed on the surface. We have a little bit of information about the orbits. We could say something about if we're lucky again, depending on the technique used and, and the coincidence of various other things, the shape of the orbit, how elliptical is the orbit. And that's critically important for understanding what the potential surface environment might be. If it's, if it's an Earth analog planet, if it's a rocky sphere with, with some kind of atmosphere, um, <clears throat> you know, there are fundamental things that are really almost impossible to derive at the moment so, for example, the rotation rate of a planet. There's only a few cases of quite unusual systems where we have gas giant planets orbiting very close to their parent stars where we can put some kind of constraint on how fast those planets are rotating. Uh, and the rotation of a planet is, again, a, a key piece of information for understanding what the surface environment may be like. We don't have that yet. We don't really even have information about the, the tilt of a planet's axis. So there's some 
really fundamental things we just don't have yet. And so there's a real limit on what we can say about these worlds. I mean, you mentioned the Trappist-1 system with its seven planets, which is extraordinary. Uh, but can we really say much about whether that planet is potentially habitable or that planet is potentially habitable? Only in the crudest terms, because we, we don't really know their composition. Uh, we don't know how fast they're spinning. We think they may be tidally locked to their parent star, so they have a permanent day side and permanent night side, but that's conjecture. Uh, so, as Lee said, we're kind of, we're over that first hump in this revolution, which is, oh, there are planets out there, <laughs> and there's lots of them, and we have basic data. The next challenge and the thing that everybody's working towards right now and, and the next immediate generation of astronomical instruments is going to begin to reveal are things like composition, things like what the real surface temperature is of these planets, what's, what molecules are in their atmospheres, um, which are actually critically important pieces of data because that kind of data may give us the first hints really within a few years for some of these worlds, perhaps, if we're lucky, um, <laughs> of systems that, you know, maybe something's weird going on there. Maybe that weird thing is life. Maybe there are biospheres altering the chemistry of, of these planets, and we can sense that by looking at the composition of their atmospheres. So we're in this kind of wonderful yet frustrating place right now in history <laughs> where... Well, so... Let me ask you, Lee. It's very hard to talk about this for, for longer than a few minutes without, it, without starting to sort of ease into sort of uh, two, two intimately related um, issues. So, okay, fine, so astronomy and exoplanets, and it's beyond astonishing that we're actually beginning to find these places. I mean, when I was growing up as a journalist, even, there was one solar system in the universe, and anybody who thought otherwise was a crackpot. Um, and you mentioned one of them just a moment ago um, with Barnard Star, um, who went to his grave um, insisting he was right, um, right, although everybody still believes he was quite wrong. Um, and this, this endeavor is embedded uh, in our sense of ourselves and our sense of where we are in the universe. And I wonder, uh, from your standpoint as a journalist now, um, how this cascade of discoveries, astronomers will now talk with a straight face about the statistical probability of billions of planets. Um, what does that start to do to us? I, well, I think it, it gives us a better sense of uh, cosmic context, obviously, and, and that can go many different ways uh, because uh, when we think about the search for life, um, life-bearing planets, planets like Earth, uh, we can easily imagine many different scenarios unfolding. The, the, the notion of there being billions of planets in the galaxy, in our galaxy alone, um, is unquestionable, even though it's st a statistical argument. Um, the question is, how many of those planets might really be much like Earth? And of course, this is assuming that life needs an Earth-like planet. I'm not saying it does, but we have to, that's how we're gonna probably find something that we're gonna recognize. It's like looking in the mirror. So. Um, how many of those, are those planets like Earth, uh, and then how many of them have life we can recognize? Um, we could you can imagine scenarios where we look out to the nearest 100 or 1,000, or probably not 10,000 stars, that's, that's pretty ambitious. Let's say 100 or 1,000, or maybe in the nearest 100 light years or something. And we see planets that appeal to us because they do resemble our own in some basic sense. Uh, but then we look at them closer and closer, we build bigger and bigger space telescopes to really gaze at them and look at their atmospheres, look at their surfaces, look for signs of life, uh, and we don't see it, right? Uh, and so you can imagine that scenario unfolding, uh, in which case it would be kind of a, not a full refutation, but definitely a blow against the Copernican principle that we've been operating under for hundreds of years, which of course Caleb can talk much more about since he wrote a book that was on that topic, uh, which is that we're not special, that we're mediocre, we're average. And uh, that might not really be the case at all if we look out far enough and we don't see anything remotely mm -hmm. like what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Conversely, of course, we could look out and we could find that Earth-like planets are kind of common mm -hmm. as dirt, so mm -hmm. to speak, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you know, there's little green men waving at us every single time we look. Well, <laughs> you know, I want to, we'll, we'll <laughs> dig into our 
infinite capacity for mediocrity uh, in a minute. <laughs> but I'd like to stay with the little green men for a moment because I think that is something that really uh, both plagues and drives um, uh, coverage, uh, communication, and, and contaminates research um, in this area. I mean, all at once. Um, uh, you know, so are you, uh, you know, you're very excited about exoplanets, but are you also excited about uh, alien megastructures around Tabby's star? Um, well, you know, are uh, you home listening on your shortwave to whatever that star was, the Russians? <laughs> yeah, uh, so. This is all stuff in the last year, right? I don't have to go back very far to right. find. Uh, well, the, late, the latest one was, what is it? Uh, there was, there's work from Harvard uh, from one of my good friends. I shouldn't say good friend, but acquaintance, uh, Avi Loeb. Uh, who's a professor at Harvard who wrote a co-authored a paper looking at uh, these things called fast radio bursts. Oh, these yeah, yeah. That's another mm, like millisecond mm -hmm. scale, very powerful bursts mm -hmm. of radio waves that we see coming from random spots in the sky. And he did a calculation with, with a buddy that basically said, oh, well, this could easily be uh, a solar collector that's twice the surface area of the Earth, gathering all, the, uh, all this energy mm -hmm. from a star and concentrating mm -hmm. it into a laser pulse to, right. to propel a, uh, a spacecraft to interstellar intergalactic speeds. Uh -huh. um, is that the case? It could be. It could also be, you know, uh, random burps from, you know, flares from, from a pulsar or something. Yeah. So, so, so let me ask you, Kelbar, are you equally unhinged? <laughs> <laughs> to him or to these other guys? <laughs> well, no, seriously, it yeah. does seem to well, me that this is a, this is a thread of, of research um, and coverage of this research is afflicted yeah. with the same problem yeah. where yeah. it is yeah. inseparable from what I'll just happily call the fringe. Yes, I mean, well, as you were just describing that, um, the, the fast radio burst interpretation. I wasn't endorsing that, by no, the way. No, no, and, you but, know, and but, I think, so, well, the so interesting... there's the Tabby Star, which was a legitimate concern, but the explanation was Larry Niven-style ring worlds, but uh, the, the fast radio burst, and then this. Yeah. But I think what's so interesting to me is, mm -hmm. yes, these are still, I mean, you know, people who, the scientists who put forward some of those interpretations, they know full well that this is a, you know, a preconception of the probability of that being the correct answer tells us it's probably not the correct answer. But what's so interesting to me, having been in astronomy for a number of years and for some fraction of that time thinking about exoplanets and looking for life in the universe, is that I think the fidelity of the data that we now have, the fidelity of our informa the information that is pouring in about the universe is such that along on the list of what is this crazy looking phenomenon, putting something that's to do with technology, a techno signature, another civilization is no longer quite as crazy as it perhaps once was. Mm -hmm. And it's because we're getting, we're digging into the, the noise of the universe to a level where stuff ought to start showing up any day now, I think. So you, you want a crazy fringe and, no, you know, no, so I'm I, just fulfilling I want you the... to reveal yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> and to be I, honest so, about your motivations. Oh, so yeah. I think, um, I think it is increasingly valid on those lists of, instead of saying, well, fast radio bursts, well, it's probably some neutron star doing something it shouldn't, or a black hole falling uh -huh. into, you know, I don't know, some political parade somewhere or, or whatever, <laughs> um, you know, on the other side of the universe, the, on, on, on the line, uh, on the list of items is, you know, you know, maybe this is a, you know, civilizations with convergent evolution having all driven them to produce light sail interstellar spacecraft firing off one of those spacecraft. Now, do we think that's likely? No, not really, but that's, that's a healthy sort of skepticism. Um, but the data quality now and the, hmm. the, the amount of data that we have, I think gets us to a point where you know, it is valid to, to put that out as a hypothesis, much more so than say in the 1970s when SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence was you know, kind of gearing up and starting to listen for things using radio telescopes. In retrospect, as valiant as those attempts were, they, they were very, very limited. And we, we have a greater appreciation just how limited those attempts were. So it's not just fun, it's not just fringe flakiness. I think it's an increasingly, not, not a totally valid thing to us, but it, it's getting there. And it's, it's important, I think, to note also uh, another interesting phenomenon, which is essentially largely a knee-jerk desire or, or tendency to uh, reject these sorts of claims out of hand. So extraordinary claims do require extraordinary evidence, right? That's something I think everyone could agree on. 
Um, but, but because of what Caleb mentioned, where there's been a mixture of very fringe, totally uh, beyond the pale ideas that, that frankly have no basis whatsoever in empirical fact. Um, you know, I mean, you can think about a lot of um, goofy claims that, that emerged, that, have, that, have, that keep emerging, that have been emerging for, for generations, um, that just have no shred of evidence to back them up. There, there's that stuff. And then there's also what you're talking about, where you see just very strange things in data that are very hard to explain. It doesn't mean that it's going to be little green man or te techno signatures, but, mm -hmm. it, but it means that you know, once you've eliminated all these other explanations, anything you can come up with, and it's still there and it's unexplained, you do need to seriously start thinking about the notion that, that could be what you're seeing. And there's a tendency, again, because of the contamination of all this other nonsense, to, to kind of not take that seriously, I think. And you see that both in journalists, you see it in scientists, and you see it in the public. Well, I just know that when Stephen Hawking <laughs> says he's very afraid <laughs> of the visitors, <laughs> I think maybe I should be worried. But I also know that we used to see angels, and not so long ago we saw faces on Mars, and now we see strange things orbiting around stars we can't see very clearly. So I do kind of wonder about how the two of you, each in your own way, navigate that confusion. <laughs> because as we're about to find, as you said, the data starts to get very squirrely very soon. Yeah. For instance, yeah. one of the ideas that people have been working with in this area uh, in recent years is this idea of the an anthropic universe, that this universe is so perfectly tailored in terms of the laws of physics that clearly it was designed solely and completely just for things like us who could sit and have conversations as we are now about what does it all mean. Right. I mean, wh wh where does that, Dan, you, you, you have dug into this. Yeah, so, I, you know. This, it, explain, the, explain this. Right, so the anthropic principle, um, really the, these, those ideas, uh, sort of the modern version of those ideas started up back even in the 1950s and 60s as physicists were learning more about the fundamentals of the universe and matching the, the fundamental theories of gravity and quantum mechanics and particle physics to our increasing knowledge about uh, cosmology, so observations that tell us that the universe is expanding and therefore it, it has a finite age. Uh, and physicists started to see that there are a number of independent properties of the universe, so things like the, the relative strength of electromagnetic forces and gravity, for example. Those two things, right now we have no underlying theory that predicts what those should be, and even if we did, there's nothing that says they have to be in the particular ratio that they are today. And that ratio between electromagnetic forces and gravity, if you changed it a little bit, you wouldn't get things like stars forming in the universe. You wouldn't get things like planets. You wouldn't get all that comes from that. You make stars, you make heavy elements, you make planets, you make life, and so on. And there are other things too, other, other so-called tunings that if you go and look, you can come up with this is about half a dozen of these seeming coincidences of fundamental characteristics of the universe, you know, properties, numbers, fundamental constants of the universe. And if you changed any of them just a teensy bit, you'd subvert the whole pathway to stars, planets, life, and so on. And you know, this is kind of unsettling if this is the only universe. This unsettling why? Because it's saying that there is something going on. You know, why, if, if any of those individual quantities could just be a randomly chosen thing, why did they all get randomly chosen to allow for the production of stars and elements and life? And so some people interpreted this in an anthropic way. <laughs> and they said, well, you know, that's kind of interesting. It's so interesting, it's more, perhaps more than a coincidence. It's saying that the existence of us, it could be any life in the universe, but they tend to talk about you know, life here, is telling us something about the universe. So in the, in the sort of weakest interpretation of this, you could use that fact to actually start to make predictions about physics. Say, well, if we can understand what's necessary for us to exist, that will unveil key things about fundamental physics. 
right? The tuning of the universe can be unveiled not by studying cosmology, but by figuring out the, the details of life. The stronger version of this interpretation is that the universe cannot exist without making life. That life is somehow centrally important to the existence of everything. And this is with, you know, this is without even invoking the idea of a designer or a creator or anything. It's just physicists down the pub. Life is going somehow wax, embedded wacky. in the laws of physics. And yeah, that there's something inevitable. Exactly right. Inevitable is a good word. That that it had, you know, it had to happen this mm -hmm. way. And I, you know, for, for me that feels really uncomfortable. Yeah. <laughs> because again, because it, it's kind of counter it is directly counter to well, you mentioned mediocrity. Right, so the Copernican ideas, the Copernican revolution that unfolded over the 400 years following Copernicus, you know, by the 20th century had given rise in um, cosmology as people were applying Einstein's uh, general relativity to, to describe the behavior of the universe as a whole. They'd taken it even further and there was this idea of cosmic mediocrity that not only we not special, no place in the universe is special. There is no center to the universe, there's no physical center to an expanding universe. That's a central piece of Einstein's description of, of the dynamics of the universe. And it's the same in all directions. It's isotropic, it's, it's homogenous. Um, and that's been termed cosmic mediocrity. And then along, along come these other people looking at the, the fundamental properties of the cosmos and saying, well, actually, you know what? No, life is something completely linked to the fabric of the cosmos. We are significant. That's what it would tell you. Now, is significance news? Is significance news? Is significance news? <laughs> well, as you can see, it takes quite a lot of, I think, building up to explain why we're significant in a cosmic sense. It's, uh, it, it doesn't usually, that's not the, what you lead with normally on you know, the first couple of graphs <laughs> of the story. Um, oh, come on, put Einstein's <laughs> really? uh, field equation down. I mean, I think that's the essence of social media, right? Me. Right, know? yes, we are I, I exist, yeah. But of course, you know, Caleb uh, has a lovely argument about why we may be significant, but we may yet not be special. Well, I'm, trying, I'm oh. trying to cheat, but, that's a, but, but just to complete the, the story, so, you know, this, this anthropic idea yeah. actually helped drive thinking about the idea of a multiverse. Because one way out of this thing that makes you know, reductionist scientists like me so uncomfortable, you know, there's nothing special about us, is to say, well, okay, if this was the only universe ever, whatever that really means, then it, then it, become, then it is difficult to explain. Right? Then that's where this anthropic principle becomes strong. But what if this is just one of a gazillion universe-like things? and each one has a different mix of properties, yeah. then it's inevitable that you are going to find yourself in a universe capable of producing life, problem solved. Mm -hmm. and, we can, we, and we can comfortably leave it to one of those other multiverses to figure out the meaning of it all. Well, that too. <laughs> Except, you know, it's a problem solved by invoking 10 to the 10 to the 10 yeah. to the 7 yeah. alternate realities. Yeah. And, and we may be back in face on Mars territory. <laughs> Sorry, but you've been very patient. I'm oh, yes. So while we may laugh at some crazy ideas people come up with yeah. to explain the universe and what it all means and whether we're alone, how beneficial is it, especially in this line of work, to propose outlandish theories? Yeah, Well, I think, uh, I mean, it, it, I'm, I would obviously be speaking very differently than Caleb in terms right. of, you know, I'm not going to put my name on an academic paper and upload it to the Astro... <laughs> Astro PH archive or something. Um, I but think you have license to call things outlandish. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, as, but as a scientist, I mean, I, I feel like uh, the benefit from someone like me putting forth an outlandish theory, or not necessarily a theory of my own, um, but rather reporting on it, is that um, I guess there's kind of a marketplace of ideas. There, there's, the, you know, when you when you get I maybe mean, this is the wrong phrase to use, but essentially by publicizing it, it, it very quickly will either sink or swim. I think, and and. The, any, you know, for instance, the, the paper that I just mentioned about, um, about that Avi Loeb wrote about fast radio bursts maybe mm -hmm. being the products of aliens, uh, that kind of got 
a lot of attention after people started writing about it and tons of uh, astronomers and astrophysicists were saying, well, this is why this is a ridiculous idea or here's the way we could test this idea or you know, here's why this doesn't work, so on and so forth. So by publicizing those ideas, I think um, you can increase the efficiency of the scientific process. You can maybe arrive at some semblance of truth, or whatever that means, uh, faster mm -hmm, mm -hmm. by doing so. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, let's stick with the, with, with the question. It's a good one. Is this, this, this is a, an area perhaps where it's a little harder to tell the difference initially, maybe, between uh, um, a usefully outlandish idea <laughs> and an idea that's simply fringe. Um, Caleb, how do, you, how do you, what's the filter you run through those <laughs> things? Because you're not just sit, sitting there writing grants, you're also carrying this bucket to the public. Sure. I mean, you both yeah. are, so. I, mean I, you know, I think it's, it's a great question. I actually, I see a lot of value in outrageous ideas. Um, and, but at the same time, you know, there's a difference between the, the club of scientists you know, drinking beer and flinging outrageous ideas at each other, which is an incredibly useful thing. I mean, that, that freedom, that intellectual freedom is really important. And I think in the history of science, there have been things that have been pushed along by people being willing to say crazy stuff to each other. It gets really tricky when it comes into the public forum. Because as you say, you know, often these are extremely exciting, appealing ideas. I mean, I, I wrote an article a while back, which I knew was kind of crazy speculative, talking about <laughs> Reddit. That one, that, one, that one bit you pretty hard. Um, yeah. yeah, so on, on so, I mean, if you want a crazy, outrageous idea, and it, it, was, it was not based on any research. It was simply a, an article for a broader audience about extrapolating how life might evolve in the long term. And I made comments about, well, maybe dark matter, which permeates yes. the universe, yeah. is capable of holding more complex structure. And perhaps earlier civilizations have uploaded themselves into dark matter because there's some benefit to doing that long term. I mean, oh, completely crazy. <laughs> um, but it was fun. And my colleagues actually read it and said, yeah, this is great. It's provocative. It's sort of interesting. And I, you know, it's fine to have this discussion. But what happened was the tabloids got hold of it. And so next thing I know, I'm getting calls from people in England because the British tabloids got hold of it, first of all. And I, I became the you know, radical Ivy League professor promotes you know, the fact that we were all living inside an alien. <laughs> um, that explains it. <laughs> that, it could actually explain quite a lot. Um, and you know, on the one hand, it was sort of, it was amusing to me, yeah. but at the same time, I felt a little sense of despair because yeah. what happens is, you know, it gets distorted. And the last thing I want to do is for some, especially a young person who's actually interested in science, seriously interested in science, seeing that and getting the wrong idea about the scientific right. process. Well, first of all, if you had said that in front of Lee and I, we'd have gone for it. Right, and we would have attributed it to a distinguished Columbia University <laughs> astrobiologist. So, so I want to understand. So, so what part of this idea that the tabloids actually distort? I mean, I say this with all respect, but weren't you the one out there like oh, leading the charge? I mean, come on, yeah. Because well, to speculate they, in a useful way is to still speculate. Right, but but to make that kind of speculation, I think in a valid way, it comes along with a lot of subtle commentary, and that's what was in the original. Piece, it was a lot of lead up. You know, how might we get to the point of making that conjecture? Because that's an interesting process. And all of that disappeared and was replaced with kind of the, the simplified banner, which again sort of distorted the, the message of the piece and, and, and tried to, you know, to simplify it, to make uh -huh. it eye catching. You know, we all live inside a giant alien, uh -huh. which is not <laughs> what, yeah. I, what I was getting it at. It is our fault. It yeah, is your, yes. Well, we'll yeah. take blame. Yeah, it's, but but I but at the same time I completely understand. You know, I mean, a journalist has a finite amount of space, a finite right. amount of time, pressure to do things that will get read, especially yeah. these days. So, um, so Lee, is it safe for an astrobiologist to conduct thought experiments in public? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I think there's obviously a spectrum of coverage, and, and uh, I think so. I think so. And, and, and the problem, I guess, to some degree, is, is a lot of folks 
uh, don't necessarily know how to evaluate sources. They don't know how to evaluate the difference between, say, a story that was written very quickly from the Daily Mail and, and something that might be written in Scientific American or Wired or, or Gizmodo, you know, various places. So, um, <laughs> Why are you the key <laughs> yeah. so um, I, I mean, I, I think it's important. I think, I think otherwise, the self-censorship is dangerous, and that actually leads to, you know, potentially stifling a very important ideas that could that could be transformative. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Uh, thanks for the compliment. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, don't you think, though, so this is about just multiverse theorem particularly, um, but can't some of these theories be dangerous in that, you know, multiverse theorem is saying that these values exist, you know, let's say, let's just take like the mass of an electron, for example, right? It exists in an infinite number of different masses all across the multiverse, but um, isn't that then sort of writing off the hard work that scientists are doing to try and find the actual specific values, like why the electron weighs how much it does? Shall I yeah. respond to that? Yeah, uh -huh. I, you know, I, I kind of agree. I mean, it's, it's um, and, you know, lots of string theorists are not so popular because they promote th some of these ideas and, and yeah, you know, I mean, it raises both the scientific question of why bother figuring out the details of this universe when it's going to be different in you know, a trillion, trillion, trillion other realities. You know, maybe we should just try to study that more, except we can't really study that, so that's kind of a, a end point. But there are also, there are some really interesting questions. I haven't really thought about this, but I've seen people bringing this up about uh, the nature of morality. You know, so I can go and push Lee. Please don't. <laughs> and that's okay, because in a gazillion other universes, I didn't do that. Right? Or some version of me didn't do that. And so it's, it's sort of ultimate, you know, you can abandon all, all sense of morality because does it really matter what I do in this universe when... It's very <laughs> yeah. postmodern. It's very postmodern. Well. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the multiverse, right, it, it's, it's not a particularly satisfactory answer. It does go against a lot of the... the, the evolution of Western science up to this point, which is meticulous dissection, looking for greater truth, trying to, you know, the mass of the electron. Maybe there's some mystery in the mass of the electron that we'd like to unveil. But if it's a different mystery in every universe, then who cares? Yeah. Right? Yeah, I, I, don't know. I just think it's important to note, obviously, that, that the, the idea of a multiverse is, is very well motivated beyond the idea of, of fine-tuning, right? Because it's a pretty natural product of inflation theory. So the idea that, that the universe went through a dramatic and exponential uh, phase of expansion, ex accelerated, not accelerated, but you know, very, 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 very fast expansion very, very early in its life, um, Seems like, and again, I, I am speaking far, far above my pay grade, but uh, essentially, as I've been told, uh, it's very hard to get out of a scenario there, if you believe in inflation, where you don't have a multiverse of one sort or another. And there's many different types of multiverses to talk about, but, but a universe that is essentially practically infinite in, in extent would be one of them, in, in which case, uh, you know, multiverses in a way could be defined by... Um, you think about like, I like to call it the Hubble bubble sometimes, Hubble bubble, you know, the size of, of our actual observable universe, which is like, what, I mean? Oh, right, right. Yeah, yeah. so if, if the universe is- 10 to the 27 meters. This guy. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, if it's 60 <laughs> miles per hour. <laughs> yeah. If there's lots and lots of other regions that we're causally disconnected from that will never be causally connected yeah. to because of the increased expansion, then it, I mean, the idea yeah. of, of multiverse falls pretty naturally out of that. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? So let me, let, me, let me shrink our expanding universe here just for a second, down to our next question. So, I leave, hey. um, look, in, in some ways, we're really just at the beginning of what's gonna be a very confusing era. Uh, we're gonna start collecting data about these plants around other stars. You start getting a little bit of information about their physical properties, and you start seeing things like, oh, that one looks odd, that one looks interesting, that one's peculiar, I don't quite understand that. What kind of a framework do we need to, to make sense of that? Because there's going to be years and years of confusion of things that look kind of odd and kind of peculiar, and maybe mm. it's life and maybe it isn't. Do we need a color coding system? Do we need uh, you know, a, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, you know, a body of mm -hmm. scientists who sort of evaluate claims and, and, and mm -hmm. give a read? It's going to be very confusing, and not just for the public, but I think you know, even in the scientific community, of mm -hmm. how do we evaluate you know, every single 
it's a given that they're all going to look odd because everything we've seen so far looks odd. As we get more information, we're going to see more oddities. Yeah. How, do we, you know, how do you judge at what point you say, this looks odd because it's probably life, at which point you say, this looks odd because nature is full of strange exotic things we don't understand? That's a great question. So um, I want you both to take a stab at it, but let's start with Cal. What's the framework that you bring to this going forward? Oh, it is a good question. It's a really yeah. good question. Um, <coughs> Yeah, so, okay, I, I'll, try to give, I'll try to keep it fairly brief. You know, my feeling is from the astronomical point of view, you know, unless we're extraordinarily lucky and some unexpectedly vivid signature lands in our lap for some particular planet that says there is nothing else that this can possibly be except life, and I'm not quite sure what that signature would be. Uh, I think we will be in the situation where maybe we'll survey a thousand worlds and we'll establish a little bit more about each of those. Maybe it will be their chemistry or something. I actually, and I even proposed this a few years ago, think that we may find that we'll look at this, this great population of planets with this, this slightly more colorful data, and we'll say, well, you know, there's like 15% of these just look different. There's something going on. And we can't say for sure that it's life, but We'll, we're going to bring in what we know about Bayesian statistics. We were talking about this earlier, uh, which is a way of evaluating your confidence in certain answers given the data and what your, your earlier assumptions are, your prior assumptions are. Uh, you know, we may be stuck with that kind of answer for quite a long time where it's like, yeah, you know, 15% of Earth-sized planets in the universe look kind of peculiar and it's a sort of eighty percent chance that's life. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, so the other part of me, when this comes up, says, you know, actually we should be doing SETI <laughs> because it may be that the only way to definitively prove that there is life on a planet around another star is if it talks to us. Hmm. Lee, I, I agree in large. I knew when 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 you went with Caleb first, I was oh, he's going to steal my answer. Oh, but I'm no, sorry. Yeah, no, no. I, but I agree in the same but way. That's uh, because we're both brilliant people. I'm a same mind, yes. <laughs> um, but I, I, I agree with Caleb that you know you can you can see some interesting things by doing statistical analyses of an increasingly large data set um, and and finding curious patterns in them. But of course, as Corey mentioned, I mean you're going to find strange things wherever, and it seems like probably the more the bigger the sample is, the more strange things you'll find of one sort or another. But you can mm -hmm. still categorize them, so that's a really important point. But I do agree that uh, I think it's somewhat I don't want to say criminal, but it's a shame. That, uh, that SETI is really seen and, and kind of looked down upon, I think, in a lot of uh, scientific circles and, and hasn't really received, for instance, much federal funding at all for quite a long time, since I think the 1990s. Um, so, you know, if, yeah. if you get a signal, obviously, yeah. then you can get straight to work. You can, you can really start doing amazing things. Um, but otherwise, you're going to be left with all sorts of nasty degeneracies about what the place is Yeah, really but like. I want to make you stick back to uh, address the not what in one way is the novelty question. Okay, so he can work with the large data sets and look for statistical anomalies and probabilities, but you're back here as uh, further up the food chain or down the food chain? Down. Hard to know. Down, um, down. But uh, uh, even now, you know, um, it's uh, new exoplanets, that's not front page news. Uh, uh, maybe it's front page news, it's made out of solid diamond and it's on somebody's <laughs> finger. It, that's front page news. <laughs> But at any rate, how do you sort through these things as a science journalist who's supposed to be keeping an eye on uh, fringe figures like uh, Professor yes. Scharf over here? Yes, notorious figures of ill repute, <laughs> such as Caleb Scharf. I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, have to, I have to say that even though I, I've, I've learned a whole lot about this subject, you know, I'm not, I would not uh, be so bold to call myself really an expert. So I, I really do rely upon uh, polling of the experts, just like you know, any other, I think, good journalism story is gonna, gonna pan out. You're really having to look at uh, how excited folks are, and then you have to use, you have to weigh your own personal experience with, you know, well, has this happened before where there's been, you know, something that everyone's been very excited about that's been totally wrong and insane. Uh, and so it, mm -hmm. I, there's not really a very good question other than just, or a good answer to that question, I think, other than mm -hmm. just, you know, the, the same things that you do with any mm -hmm. other type mm -hmm. of journalism. But I think, I mean, it, it's Go interesting ahead. listening to you say that. I mean, I, I feel like, I, I feel like you, you're given a handicap at the outset. <laughs> you know, when I write stuff for a general audience, as a scientist, I, I actually think I have greater freedom. 
I can hmm. speculate. Right? It's okay for me to speculate. I'm a scientist. <laughs> you can trust me. <laughs> um, right? I'm not trying to attain some gold standard of, of truth and journalism that I think you are, and you do very well. Um, and so it's interesting. I, it, it kind of it changes the way I write, I'm sure, compared to the way you construct your pieces. I, right? I, I'm more willing to to say something a little outrageous just to see what happens. <laughs> it's very uh, very frustrating when you're talking to a lot of sources and you all you want them to say a certain thing that you think is true and then none of them will. That's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> well, more, I have some more questions, but I, I'd like to just ask one myself. So in listening to the two of you grapple with this great question about how do you deal with the... Both of you have, have acted on the assumption that the most po interesting possible thing that you could detect and determine and explore about the rest of the universe is life. Well, why? <laughs> are I mean, we not perhaps the least interesting thing? Well, oh, I, I, I would argue that life, as far as we know, is the most complex phenomena in the universe. And that alone makes it interesting. Um, now, <laughs> you know, yes, it's a little self-serving, but I, I think we're also driven to say that life is the most interesting thing because we still want to understand ourselves. And we've never had true context, right? How does life start? What, what are the trajectories that life follows? We've had this one Petri dish, which is the Earth for a billion years. And although it's done a lot of different things and there's been a lot of different organisms and, and strategies for living states, uh, it's still the one experiment. Mm -hmm. So uh, speaking personally, I, I feel Finding stuff out there may be the only way we'll truly understand what's here. So, Lee, is the cosmos then the mirror of our vanity? Uh, yeah, I think it is. Uh, by somewhat by necessity, I think when we're getting back to you know um, uh, the question that was asked about about you know how are we going to make sense of all the data and and the most sensible way to make sense of it, I think, uh, is just to extrapolate from what we know from our two feet planted here on this planet. So you could imagine silicon life forms, uh, you know, swimming through ammonia seas or, or consciousnesses that exist in the plasma prominences of stars. But, uh, you know, it's really, you could, it's very easy to imagine that. It's very hard to actually test that or, or find a way to get it at those sorts of problems or detect them in the first place. So uh, I do think that, that we are naturally drawn to things that look like us and, and places that seem like this because that's how we're going to learn more. Yeah. Although I may have an answer for that, but we should. Uh, uh, yeah. I sometimes worry that like we're the ants that will miss the big thing. <laughs> right. S question. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Lee, thanks for setting up my question here about the uh, origin of life. Uh, so we've talked about several thousand planets out there, a certain subset of which are uh, Earth-like and stable enough, perhaps, to have liquid water. Uh, now the, let's turn to the probability of the origin of life. And I know, Caleb, you wrote a paper recently in mm. the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, 2016, mm. uh, on this. And you know, there's sort of two. I can see two views because the the difference between ordinary molecules and the self-organization uh, propagation characteristics of life as a system of molecules is so vast, it's difficult to imagine bridging that gap. Uh, and yet a lot of really interesting work is being done uh, by Nick Lane with the, the, the alkaline vents in the ocean and uh, people doing experiments in laboratories, the discovery of you know, amino acids coming in and, uh, and it, from, from meteorites. So, so some of the building blocks are there, which you're dealing with in your paper. Your paper has something to do with the, the probability of combinatorics uh, to get to life. So I was, uh, but I didn't understand your paper. <laughs> So I, was, so I was wondering, this is my opportunity to ask, could you explain uh, how, yeah. what that contribution is yeah. to the probability of the origin of life? Yeah. yeah. The well, question, what were you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, I apologize. It wasn't, it wasn't obvious. Uh, you know, that's the thing. When you write wow. for a scientific publication, right. you write, oh, I don't need to really hmm. explain this. I can just, you know. Um, yeah, so the, the, the root idea there, or the motivation for that paper was to try to build, and it was a very, I mean, it was actually a very crude paper, um, to try to build a framework for thinking quantitatively about 
how do we relate the properties of an environment like a, a planet to that probability that life could start there? And you know, that's, in a sense, we're trying to meld two worlds, the, the chemistry, biological world where people are working on you know, all of these very specific targeted questions about how do you build the first chain molecules, or can you have little chemical incubators inside hydrothermal vent systems? That's Nick, one of Nick Lane's uh, ideas and where you extract energy from and so on. But then on the other side, we've got the, the astrobiologists, the exoplanet people, trying to evaluate the characteristics of planets and maybe their chemical mix. And we want to somehow bring those together and say, oh, a planet of this mixture is going to be more likely to have had an origin of life event than not, and even within our own solar system. So stupidly ambitious thing to try to do in the paper, which is why the paper is actually kind of crude. Um, we stepped back and said, well, we could actually hide all the details away in a bunch of numbers. I mean, I'm always doing what the cosmologists do and <laughs> say, well, it's all in one number. You know, we know there's a lot of complexity, but we'll just put it in one number. And so we just did this very crude, almost a thought experiment that then turned it into a very simple equation, which is you know, to get an origin of life event, you've got to have a certain number of things come together you know, without even specifying what they are. Maybe they're molecules or collections of molecules. Uh, and they've got to come together. That may be a singular event in time, but it could actually be part of a, a, a series of events spread over time. But we'll call all of that an assembly. And if you do that, you can then begin to do some really stupid stuff by looking at the size of a planet and make some mm -hmm. assumptions about its composition, what it, this composition of its surface might be, and actually write down how many of those building blocks there could be. Now, maybe those building blocks are just atoms. Mm -hmm. So we could actually compute the number of atoms of different elements available on the surface of a planet, and then kind of fold it into this equation and start to, again, relate that microscopic assembly probability to the bigger, um, the, the large scale properties of planets. Very, very crude, but it's kind of a language we haven't had before, I think, I hope. I, you know, okay, I th so, so let me then ask this. So a lot of people think we'll never figure out how life got started on Earth because life has hidden its tracks. Life has changed the planet too much ever figure out what was going on. So are you confident that looking outward at exoplanets, you'd actually be able to determine the difference between a prebiotic planet and a biotic <laughs> planet? If that terminology makes any sense in this context. Yeah, it's, it's good terminology. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, well, I think, I, mean, I, think, I think we could, again, it, I suspect it's going to become this probabilistic statistical statement mm -hmm. about, you know, we could look in our own solar system, you look at Titan, the moon of Saturn, which has this right. incredibly rich chemistry, except it's also incredibly cold. Um, so liquid water can't exist there. In fact, the liquid element there is, is methane and ethane, hydrocarbons are liquid. Um, but there's a complex chemistry taking place there that, that could conceivably lead to the degree of complexity you need for life. Um, it's, you know, it, it, this is why I come back to SETI. Well, <laughs> it's so let's come back difficult. to the question. <laughs> yes, sir, you've been so patient. I'm going to be very happy about this. My question is actually about SETI. Uh, <laughs> Perfect. My problem's not a plant. Um, so I was wondering, <laughs> uh, earlier I was wondering, I mean, we were talking about uh, SETI being kind of valiant, if misguided, if limited. Mm. Um, and then later how it's kind of a shame how the sort of public perception of SETI is uh, kind of like wing nuts with telescopes to the skies. Uh, is, there, is there a point at which you would sort of endorse a new SETI effort? Um, and if so, how do you think we would do that in a way so that you know in 30 or 40 years we're not sitting here and laughing at the new like SETI endeavor? Uh, yeah, Lee, well, why don't you? Yeah, you're enthusiastic that's safer for me about, to, to You're cover enthusiastic it. about SETI. Well, I, I, well I think that's been going on for, for the past several years already, and really several decades if you think very fringe. So you think about SETI being fringe, and you think the fringe idea is at the edge of SETI, right? Because there's different kinds of SETI, and, and the standard type that most people think about, obviously, is electromagnetic transmissions, radio transmissions, 
uh, right. through interstellar space. But that's just one variety. Um, there's other varieties of SETI you can imagine where you're not looking for, for instance, directed transmissions. You're rather looking for, in the same way we're looking for indirect evidence of life, uh, a biosphere on a planet, you might be looking for indirect evidence of a technosphere. And this is kind of what, or te technical civilization. And this is what you were talking about when you mentioned uh, Tabby's star and the mm. idea that there's an alien megastructure around this. For, for anyone who doesn't know, that's a star that was seen by Kepler to crazy, have crazy yeah. uh, dimming in its light and go anywhere from like, you know, 1% dimming to 20% dimming, which is ridiculous. And then also maybe exhibiting a long-term dimming trend on top of these little kind of momentary dips. You put those things together and you can imagine, oh, well, the dips are clearly explained by uh, big energy collecting assemblies around the star that have been built by a super civilization that's powering it to do, you know, using that power to do God knows what. Um, but, but that isn't, the point is, is that's, that's a relatively indirect thing. That's not, that doesn't take intentionality of some alien mind around another star building a huge radio transmitter and aiming it at Earth or aiming it at the solar system. It's rather just a product of the things that they're doing there, if, if that's what's happening. Um, so long, long answer shortened, I, I, I do think that um, new approaches to SETI already do exist and, and will probably become uh, more and more in vogue as the more traditional uh, SETI that we think about uh, fades away, or, or, or I'm not saying it's going to fade away, but if it keeps getting null results after uh, Seth Shostak at the SETI Institute, I think loves to say that if we haven't found something by, what is, I don't know if he has, he put like kind of a deadline on it a little bit where he was like, you know, I think if we haven't found something in the next X number of years, then that's pretty good evidence that whatever we're, whatever we're looking for isn't within this volume that we're searching. Um, and I'm not going to put those numbers in his mouth because I don't know them offhand, but uh, there, there's a lot of opportunities beyond traditional, just, you know, uh, well, aiming a pollution. Sky. Pollution is right. an interesting one. Right? We're looking at the chemistry of planetary atmospheres. So some people have suggested, well, look for an industrial pollution. Right. Mm. Those, With those CFCs are, and stuff. You know, yeah. yeah. Why not? Yeah, I mean, it would be a pretty distinct signature. Hi. So this takes us a couple steps back, and I apologize for that. But uh, earlier, you both. Uh, sort of mentioned how when we talk about the origin of life on a planet, we sort of have to extrapolate because we only have one datum, and that's life on Earth. Um, so let's say we get the golden standard and we can see life forming on some other planet. What data would we really be able to glean from that, and how would that change the search elsewhere? I just want to say real quick and set you up maybe um, that, that it depends a, a lot on distance and how we're looking at it and what data we're getting. There's a huge difference between finding life on Mars where we might be able to send things to look at it closer versus finding very, very, f and you know, maybe you find a fossil, right? Um, versus looking at, at a little squiggle of light uh, from a distant star and, and, and looking at its spectrum and saying, oh, that looks like methane and that looks like oxygen and maybe there's water vapor there and no life, right? Huge difference. So it's, it's a real spectrum, I think, of, of there's no one steady, solid answer about what we could learn. It, it's a case by case basis. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think, um, you know, to try to give you a little bit of a, a inroad to where we might go with that. So, you know, life on Earth, has metabolism, right? So it's the exploitation of, of free energy. And actually on Earth, there are, there are literally just 10 basic metabolic processes that life deploys. Um, so we, we respire oxygen, that's our primary metabolic process. The, the bacteria that, that are methanogens that produce methane and fermentation is another of the, the 10 metabolic processes. So in principle, <laughs> in principle in air quotes, um, you might be able to map what you observe in a planetary atmosphere to the core metabolic processes at play on a planet um, in principle. And that would be, I, you know, I'm trying to give you an example of some way in to how do you probe the micro when you're looking across 100 light years and getting crude data. I think that is conceivably one way in, and that could tell you eventually something profound about the nature of, of life on that planet, assuming it follows most of the rules that life does on, on the Earth. I think we need to maybe just caveat that a little bit with, with how difficult that would be. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Incredibly We're difficult. talking about, I mean, that would be... Probably in 200 years' time. <laughs> that's, I think that's optimistic. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Have another beer. <laughs> It would take a really big telescope and really high-resolution spectroscopy. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so this is a question from Megan Bartels, who's right here. And she, uh, <laughs> she says, what do you wish average people would take away from the current state of astronomy? Uh, maybe that the, that the sky's the limit. Uh, I, I mean, in that, you know, it, it, there's, um, there's so much activity and discovery going on. Uh, and and, if, and astronomy, to be fair, obviously, we, we, we're really discussing just one tiny bit of it, which has to do with the, the rather self-centered search for things that maybe look like us, living things and living planets. Uh, it's a lot broader than that. But if we're just looking at that subset, um, there, it's, it's, uh, it's not clear where it ends. There's no... There's no end to the questions, just as there's, there's no end to the questioning about, I guess, really any other aspect of reality. You can always go deeper down the rabbit hole. Um, but there is, I think, from that, that endlessness, you can still uh, get very real, I don't want to say practical lessons about what it means to be here now, a living, breathing thing on this planet, but, but you can certainly uh, maybe appreciate where you are a little more and, and, and ground yourself a little more in, in what really is, rather than just waving your hands and th saying, oh, maybe there's aliens out there, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually, with some degree of, I don't want to say certainty, but, uh, you know, if we've, if we've looked at the nearest thousand stars, for instance, and we've looked at, at all those planets quite closely with the kind of mega telescopes that Caleb is talking about, must maybe building in 200 <laughs> years to try to get a biochemistry from, from a, little, a little pale blue dot far away. If, you know, again, if we look for that stuff, we see it everywhere. I mean, that does give you context in what it means to be here now. If, if, if we don't see that kind of stuff, again, it gives you context. doesn't mean that we're alone, but it certainly means there's not anything quite like us nearby, which I think could maybe change the way you live your daily life or how you, you know, treat each other, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think that's yeah, a but great does, does Do astronomers place this at the top of their list of things they'd like to do? Because it strikes me that like, maybe the answer to that is not really. They'd, much rather find something interesting about sterile neutrinos or sure. master yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. the gravitational wave, you know. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, you know, astronomy, like, a, like any big scientific field, has many specialties within it, many things that different people find more or less compelling. Uh, so some people today would say, well, the, the, the measurement, the detection finally of gravitational waves is the thing we should all be doing because this is a way of studying the universe that we have never had before. It's a brand right. new way of looking at the universe. And yes, and there are all sorts of strange and interesting phenomena out there. Um, I, you know, so I think that's, that's fair. I mean, there's, there's more than just planets and life. I, you know, if I could, the one thing I would say, um, if I could be a little poetic about it, um, and this also speaks to something Corey mentioned about the diversity of planets out there. You know, even with rudimentary data, we'll, we'll begin to see that, that extraordinary diversity and we're going to find surprises. And, you know, the poetic aspect of that for me personally is that, um, you know, it's, it, we're beginning to see new landscapes and in human history as people have moved around the surface of the planet and been exposed to new vistas, new landscapes. It's, it's generated new ideas, it's altered our culture, it's altered the, you know, the, the way in which we perceive ourselves and, and the rest of the world. And these other worlds out there, which are going to be diverse beyond anything I could easily imagine right now, um, have the potential to do that. It's not a terribly scientific response, but you know, Science isn't just about hard facts, it's about well, opening I, our I eyes. Think, I, I want to make it clear that when I asked my question, I, what I was trying to get at was the idea that this may be an area that people are actually intensely mm. interested in and that sure. scientists are not so interested in uh -huh. and that there's an interesting yeah. divide yeah. there in the communities of interest. I mean, I think scientists are very interested in it, but it's true that, you know, for example, when I teach <laughs> at Columbia, the two things, the two topics that are guaranteed to get a good class show up is either cosmology or life in the universe, right? If I'm talking about neutron stars or radio astronomy, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, question? Oh, hi. Um, so, I'm taking an atmospheric science class right now, and we had a guest lecturer recently who um, is a professor who studies basically the history of climatology, and she was talking about how uh, when snowball earth occurred, the average temperature of the earth fell below 
um, the accepted temperature threshold for which life is expected to survive. And she was basically calling for more collaboration between different scientific fields and cosmologists in order to get a better understanding of whether or not uh, life exists on other planets. So do you agree that a more collaborative approach is uh, in need and are there steps being taken to incorporate this right now? Should I go for that? Or? I'll just say that uh, yeah, astrobiology please, please. is fundamentally uh, an interdisciplinary science uh, that you can't understand uh, life and how it springs up and emerges and, and occupies a planet without, without understanding you know, geology, biology, physics, uh, astrophysics. I mean, you know, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum and if you find, again, little green men to talk to there and all of a sudden you have to worry about sociology and economics and art and all that other stuff. <laughs> Uh, so, so uh, I do think that, that that sort of interdisciplinarity is necessitated by, by the magnitude of the problem and the, the question. Let yeah, me, let me I, just rephrase that slightly and say, well, okay, Caleb, so um, you're an astrobiologist. Are you, are you truly interdisciplinary or are you just interdisciplinary for an astronomer? <laughs> well, I'm definitely interdisciplinary for an astronomer. I'm the strangest astronomer I know. Um, but. Yeah, no, I mean, people have recognized this for quite a long time. And so in astrobiology, you will find geophysicists and chemists and biologists and astronomers and physicists, you name it, uh, often working together, sometimes working sort of apart, but then getting together and presenting their results to each other. So I think and NASA in the US has been <coughs> instrumental in pushing that interdisciplinary side to the research, because you're absolutely right. But we learn about the history of the Earth. You know, the Earth today is one tiny snapshot of a four billion year history. And so at different points in Earth's history, it was like it was an exoplanet, right? And Snowball Earth is a great example of that. Some of my colleagues at Columbia and the Goddard Institute for Space Studies here in New York uh, are studying those things. And they are a group where they have a, you know, a computer programmer, a climate systems modeler and a, a um, geophysicist or a geologist who specializes in snowball earth. Maybe it was the same person, I don't know. Um, yeah. So, uh, Professor Fagan. Hi. Uh, so, we've made it more than an hour into this discussion and we have not talked about the planet that we know the most about, uh, our own planet. And maybe that's a good thing considering we all could use a break from talking about our planet, I think, um, lately. But I guess my question is from an astrobiology standpoint, you know, given that we are at a time where there's political controversy mm. over Earth monitoring, you know, what, what, so from an astrobiology standpoint, what's left to learn via remote sensing of this planet that would mm. actually be useful from an astrobiology point of view? We know, at least most of us know, there are lots of good reasons to do remote sensing of Earth, but, but from this particular perspective, what, 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 what do we not know that we would be interesting to know? Well, I can start, a, start off answering that. Um, well, actually, you know, one of the most straightforward things is that, although we talk in astrobiology about monitoring other Earths around other stars, where we, all we get is a speck of light, and we take that light and we split it into its component frequencies and analyze that. Um, the interesting thing is that we haven't done that really for the Earth. We take these beautiful images of the Earth and sophisticated satellites monitoring Earth systems. Uh, you, you can see individual clouds and, and regional variations. But actually right now uh, there's an urgent need for data that treats the Earth like an exoplanet, that studies it in a way that is compatible with how uh, instruments will detect and study exoplanets. And so even the, I guess it used to be called GORSAT, um, oh, yeah, <laughs> you know, you yeah. can actually stitch together the data, for, or discover, right? It's called discover now. Um, you can stitch the data together from that to do this. And, and some of my colleagues have been working on that. And it's really important because, for example, something as simple as um, the variation of cloud cover on the Earth now, we can see that in great detail, but what we'd really like to see is its impact on Earth if all you could see of Earth was like a tiny pixel and just a continuous stream of light. As different cloud structures move across the surface, there are minute variations in the amount of reflected light coming from a, a planet with clouds. 
Um, but that has a particular character. And for the Earth, we actually don't really have that data. Um, so there's a really important connection between all of the Earth monitoring science and exoplanetary science, for sure. And that's just one example. So we go, please. Well, that's maybe one of the best examples. And, and, and just to show the need that he's talking about, uh, people have resorted to things like looking at Earth shine on the moon when, when we have, uh, for instance, a, a lunar eclipse. Uh, and trying to look at that light to, to reconstruct what's happening here on Earth, and they can see, and you can, it's amazing the things you can pull out of that, that rather strange data that, that's rather indirect. Uh, so it's a good test of models. And, and you know, just a better fundamental understanding of the Earth system is gonna be important from the viewpoint, again, of extrapolation, of, of, of having a, a good basis from which to uh, judge other things. So we still don't have a good sense, I think, of um, I think methane sources and sinks to a very high degree. On, on this planet, um, I think someone, I'd love it if someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and methane, of course, is one of the primary so-called biosignatures that we'd be looking for on other uh, putatively habitable planets or on other stars. So, you know, if, if we, how can we say that a little, you know, a little spectroscopic signature of methane indicating its abundance at X amount in this faraway atmosphere, how can we say that that's life if, if we don't even have a good sense of I don't know quite what the error bars are for, for methane sources and sinks in our own atmosphere, but again, I think they're much higher um, than they should be, and, they, and we have the technology and the capability to really reduce those a lot. So the better we understand the Earth system, the better we're gonna be able to understand other places. Just wanna make sure I understand, because this is interesting, that the 50-some years of fairly in, increasingly intensive Earth observation data that we have done, these wonderfully marvelous multispectral uh, geosync, low Earth orbit, you name it, skeins of satellites collecting data that, uh, that's not enough? <laughs> it gets you part of the way there, um, but it's, you know, it's been taken for very specific purposes. So, for mm. example, you know, hyperspectral imaging, sure. looking at different, sure. different filters to try to deduce land use and so mm -hmm. on. Um, and that data you know, it, there are many different satellites that have mm -hmm. obtained that data, different instruments, and mm -hmm. in exoplanetary science, we need a high degree of precision and accuracy, and melding all of those data sets, Earth data sets together, and to calibrate them against each other in a way that would be useful mm -hmm. for exoplanetary science is, is really tough. I mean, I'm, you could do a certain amount, for sure, but it's really tough. I mean, would you need that or would you be, would it be more uh, of a learning experience to say take something like New Horizons, which is already halfway out of the solar system, and just simply turn it around for an hour and image like, well, this is what an Earth looks, this is what an industrialized right. planet looks like right. from a great distance right. if you can only see it six pixels across. And people have done that kind of experiment. Uh, I'm not sure if, if with New Horizons, oh, no, but I other, know, but I mean, other instruments. The yeah. difficulty is often those interplanetary spacecraft simply don't have the right instrument on them. They're not mm -hmm. designed for this sort of experiment. Um, and so again, you know, what you really want to do is take the Hubble telescope and put some rockets on it and take it out to you know, the orbit of Jupiter or something and then turn it around and look at the Earth and monitor. I mean, that would actually be a fantastic experiment <laughs> um, instead of bringing it back to the Smithsonian. Yeah. I mean, who cares? You know? <laughs> Do you think we could squeeze that into the $19 billion NASA budget that uh, President <laughs> Trump just is signing? You might have to uh, cut a few things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, no, I, I just wonder, is there a person behind you have a question? Yeah, he hasn't had a chance yet, if you don't mind. So on, on topics closer to home, so on, on Earth, we know that when we look into subterranean places, uh, life down there is super bi biodiverse. And so my question is, what do you think about looking in subterranean places on the moon and Mars? Uh, for instance, pit craters or caves? And should that be something that we should prioritize? I think the search for so-called cryptic biospheres that, that don't have obvious um, um, manifestations in terms of things like, uh, like 
atmospheric biosignatures is, is, is important. I think it's practically impossible to do for exoplanets because you would require essentially being there. Uh, but in the context of something like Mars, uh, I don't know about the moon, I mean, because I think Caleb could probably talk about this more. I mean, the, the, the issue is energy, right? Where is the available energy for the, uh, the organisms to use? Um, and if they're very, very deep down, I mean, it's in the case of the moon where there's still, I guess, some relic heat from its formation deep, deep inside, how did it get there? Did it arise there? Did it somehow migrate there from another place? If it arose there, uh, it's hard to imagine it arising in there, I guess. It would have to almost have been a migrant um, as based on what we know about biology right now. So I think the question of free energy is an important one. And for places like Mars or Enceladus or Europa or Titan, I think uh, it's going to be of increasing importance because it's clear that in a lot of those situations, there's nothing on the surface uh, that's going to be alive. I think that's a, that's a good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, those, those kind of places are definitely prime targets to go and look for organisms in places like Mars, uh, partly because they're more protected um, from the radiation environment on the surface, and they may contain pockets of, of water. Um, you know, there are organisms, I mean, just to, you know, this, we could unpack this all evening. I, there's a lot to, to think about here to do with the sustainability of a biosphere. Does it have to be above some critical scale in terms of energy? And uh, you know, what's the longevity, real longevity of some of these, these deep biospheres? There are organisms here on Earth, though, that, for example, have been extracted from water pockets uh, like a mile down in South African gold mines that live by themselves, which is very unusual. These are uh, microbial, single-celled organisms, most of which live in very diverse colonies. But some of these organisms, and I think it's called, it's, oh, what's it called? It's Aldax viator sulfuridis, or something like that. It's got some jazzy Latin name. And it actually, it operates because of natural radioactivity. So there's uranium ore in the rock is radioactive, that radioactivity splits water molecules. Those split water molecules split into oxygen and hydrogen. Mm. The hydrogen is the thing that the organism wants because that's a chemical energy source. And so its whole metabolism is centered yeah. around natural radioactivity. Wow. Now, on the moon, that may be tricky because I'm not sure there's that much sort of natural radioactivity, especially underground. Mars, maybe. But it's just an example of just how tenacious organisms can be. Once they get started. Once they get started. Yeah. Which I is mean, the, which I mean is if you're rock. looking at our particular flavor of life, I mean, certainly extremophiles, there is no niche on Phil. I mean, I believe it's a form of brewer's yeast that's dandy for making the kinds of IPAs that were being served here earlier. Actually survives for a surprising amount of time outside the space station. So, um, it, if you have a life form like us, I mean, at our most elemental, clearly we can survive just about anywhere. But what I wonder is, well, we've alluded to this several times. Life in the universe is very strange. And indeed, it may be much stranger than we can, in fact, recognize. I mean, this is a serious question. NASA, the National Academy of Sciences, have stroked their chins about this for a long time. But I wonder. Um, what you think about that. If we see life out there, will we know it? <laughs> Me? Who goes first? <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind plunging in. Um, it's, right, it's, yeah, it's a great question. It's a big question. I think, um, <laughs> Will we recognize it? So, you know, people have debated, for example, whether or not there's a shadow biosphere on the Earth. Mm -hmm. Right? Is there stuff here that is built out of really different components? And we'll assume it's microscopic because, you know, if, if something strange and glutinous walked past you on the street, you might go, oh, that doesn't look human. Um, well, maybe in New York, I don't know. Uh, so, 
but you know, let's suppose there's microscopic stuff on Earth that is just built out of radically different things. It's not going to show up in any bioassay. It's not going to grow in a petri dish. Even if you see it under a microscope, you may just say, oh, it's some crystal or it's some weird little mineral deposit. Um, yeah, you know, that's an open question. I mean, there could be stuff even here on the Earth that is in a sort of parallel form. It may not be very complex. Um, how would we notice it? Well, you know, life. We think if, if we try to generalize what we know about life, um, life makes a mess, <laughs> right? Um, the way I like to think about it, life uh, lowers its own entropy or disorder while increasing the entropy or disorder of the environment around it. Um, that might be something that we would notice somehow. Um, life presumably has to derive energy from somewhere whether it's chemical energy or something else, maybe it's direct electrical energy use. I mean, all of, all of chemical energy is really electrical energy. It's moving electrons and protons around, but something that isn't mediated by complex molecules. Um, you know, we, maybe we would notice it because stuff in a box is changing, except we know that it's sterile by our standards. Now, recognizing it out in the rest of the universe, I don't know. Lee, from where you stand, <laughs> is this a question that even matters? I, maybe not. Um, I, I think in an academic sense it certainly matters, but in terms of um, some sort of satiation of our curiosity, uh, you can always, um, what it, you can't prove a negative. You can't say that, that, that life is definitively not somewhere. We will never say that there's not life on Mars. We'll never say there's not life on Europa. We'll never say there's not life on any potentially Earth-like planet around another star, we'll just say, well, uh, probably not. Uh, so I, I think that, again, we, we can speculate a whole lot about, about various strange forms it could take, but um, at least at first, you know, for the foreseeable future, 200 years, we should say, I think, I think um, we're maybe going to be a little stuck, especially for exoplanets and stuff. So again, not talking about you know, going to Mars and putting on boot prints or having a nuclear-powered rover on Titan or something. Um, but for other stars that are beyond our reach for now, um, I, I just think we're going to have to we're gonna be stuck with extrapolating from things we know very well, namely us and Earth biology. That's, and that's kind of pessimistic, I think, in some way, but I think it's also realistic. But if I, so am I allowed to be fringe and flaky for a couple I of minutes? I insist on it. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So coming back to, and this, this is not, well, it's sort of related to my talking earlier about how tabloids picked up stuff I wrote about. Um, you know, there are, I think there are some really interesting questions connected to this that could maybe end up being, you know, stuff that we would look for or we, we, we would trigger a reaction. In us. So we don't know whether you can build life out of other building blocks right now. It's, you know, life as we know it, it's, it's all carbon chemistry and very particular sets of molecules. Uh, that's the substrate out of which life is, is formed. Um, I'm very interested in, and some of my research is starting to skew towards this, the question of, well, can you, if you can build life out of anything else, then it means that in principle, there are lots of ways you could build life across the universe. So maybe you can build life out of software, right? Maybe you can build in silico systems that exhibit all the characteristics that we consider to be a living system. Um, when you go down that rabbit hole, <laughs> uh, you open up all sorts of interesting possibilities about you know, what life has done elsewhere. Because mm. imagine you're a civilization that figures out how to change the substrate out of which you're made. Right? And this goes to my flaky article, but you know, then then you have to say, well, okay, it, maybe it's not built out of molecules, it's built out of other stuff altogether, but it may still build structures and so on. So when, you, when we, again, we're back to the weird things. When we th see really weird things out there, we've got to be cautious to not dismiss them out of hand. That's all I'm getting. That's my I, I fringy one, comment. Can I say one thing real <laughs> sure. quick, uh, which is that uh, what I was saying about, about um, about why I'm pessimistic and quote unquote realistic about, about us really focusing on Earth life. Uh, that's really me trying to be hopeful because I, I worry about us essentially, us being humans, but also folks like Caleb who are really at the forefront of this, scattering ourselves, scattering themselves, 
diluting their efforts because you're always looking for, you know, around some other corner, under some other rock for something that could exist there. And oh, sure. meanwhile, yeah, we, we don't focus on something that we know how to look for. Yeah. No. And so that's, yeah. that's where right. that's really coming right. from. Right. Of course, but the problem then is what you know how to look for is your keys. <laughs> Underneath the searchlight. Exactly. <laughs> Underneath the searchlight. <laughs> you, sir. Um, this is a bit of a buzzkill, but I did run it by Dan, and he said it was all right. So, um, I mean, NASA is probably one of the most loved of all of the uh, federal government administrations, and uh, I think they have this huge hype train behind them that, I mean, you can, they can post a picture, and that's a news story. And so I want to know that, sort of as journalists, how do we ensure that we're covering this field um, in a way that is still true and not buying into the hype and not just, you know, going along with the angle that's presented. You know, I haven't seen a FOIA to NASA yet, not from the top of my head at least. So that's sort of what I'm asking is how do we cut through the hype and really act like journalists? Yeah, this goes to the heart of the gullibility problem, I think. We live in a media universe in which our much beloved, uh, much well-funded National Space Agency can simply post an announcement of a briefing uh, that has to do with an astrobiological or exoplanet piece of research without saying anything else. And this will trigger headlines about, ooh, maybe uh, announcements having to do with life elsewhere or whatever. I mean, how do we keep ourselves grounded, you two? Um, I, well, I think it's important to remember that NASA, like any other agency, is run by human beings and funded by dollars, right? So it's not some kind of platonic ideal that floats out in nowhere. So, you know, following the money is something that can be useful for looking for motivations uh, behind certain programs or, or, or certain announcements. Um, that's useful. Thinking about uh, where certain scientists are in their careers uh, when they uh, make certain claims and appear at certain press conferences. Uh, you know, th these sorts of questions are, are, are important uh, to, to address when you're thinking about really seriously getting to the bottom of a story and whether it's true or not and how to treat it. But it takes a lot of, it's hard work, right? And, and when you're dealing with very rapid turnaround, uh, you know, the churn of 24-7 journalism uh, and the endless bottomless pit of, of online that can always be filled with more content, it's very, very, very tough, I think, to justify going down those rabbit holes when, when in that environment. Caleb, your yeah. view? Yeah, I think it's very difficult. And I, I will say from the other side, from the academic side, uh, people, scientists are much more savvy now, even in the last few years, about you know posting stuff on social media to kind of get interest. Maybe they write some dry, horrible journal article that usually three people and their mother would read. Um, I see increasingly, and I suppose I probably do it myself too, uh, the scientists themselves, even without the agencies that may fund them, are putting it out there. And they're getting the university that they work for to write a press release, which is usually horrible. <laughs> um, and I've seen many, many things that are, you know, they're nice little bits of science, but they're not shocking, they're not groundbreaking, they're not big but they've got a press release from the university. The scientist is posting things on Facebook. And, you know, so, and part of that is the pressure on scientists, like the agencies, to you know, get tenure, get the next grant, right? Show that they're, you know, they're a famous scientist <laughs> because we're all under this, this, this pressure to perform. Um, it's gotten worse. So I think it's, it, it must be, for you guys, it must be increasingly tough to filter that. I think increasingly it's, it's also important to re recognize the influence and impact of, of high, uh, high impact journals, uh, academic publishing, um, that, that kind of give impetus for NASA to hold press conferences when there's a major nature science paper. Uh, and there's kind of a running joke amongst some astronomers that, you know, hey, if it's, the cover, if it's astronomy and it's a cover story of nature, that means it's not going to be true in uh, two to five two, years. Two out of three years. Uh, not true. Yeah, so, so I mean, see, these, these are things that existed, but, but very rarely are those actually informing, um, uh, I think, reporters who are doing their work covering these press conferences. Very rarely are those even acknowledged or mentioned in the stories covering these press conferences. Um, so I think that's a very important thing, too, to think about, is how, how, can, how can we get um, a better um, understanding of some aspects of peer review that are taking place uh, largely behind closed doors? I mean, it feels, it feels, let's, let's okay. close the door there. <laughs> Scientists are under pressure, journalists are under pressure, and I'm under pressure to now wrap this up. We started this evening with the question of, is there life out there? And clearly we don't know, but what we have demonstrated is that there's life here. And it's energetic, and it's curious, 
and it's very, very committed to good journalism and to good science and to trying to get this most important thing right. And for that, I thank you all, and in particular, the two of you. Thank <laughs> you.